The next topic we're going to cover in this module will be over skeletal muscle fiber types. Uh, I think you guys will find this very interesting because uh, it's a pretty neat topic, right? The idea, the idea and concept that um, our skeletal muscles have uh, kind of gradations that allow us to do uh, different things so that we can you know, do endurance events so that we can go for a long time or we can have a certain fiber type that's really powerful. Uh, but with each of these, right, they each have their limitations. And we're going to uh, work through each and all of these. So um, the objectives for this lesson are uh, threefold. So first, uh, I want you to be able to differentiate uh, different fiber types and how they differ based on their biochemical or metabolic properties. We'll also be working through the exact same concept, but working through their contractile properties of each muscle fiber. And then last but not least, we'll talk about muscle fiber types and how they're used for uh, specific activities. So fiber tapping isn't new, and in fact, it's been done for a really long time. Uh, some methods are easier than others. So this is a table right out of your book um, that just kind of groups it into uh, the four ways that we can kind of classify skeletal muscle uh, with each one starting from top to bottom being easy uh, and then getting uh, more difficult to determine as we move through. So the first is red and white fibers. Red and white fibers goes back to classic physiology, right? You can actually look at um, a skeletal muscle and see that some muscles have different colors than others. Uh, so a good example of this would be uh, if you are a hunter and have ever seen uh, going out and comparing a dove muscle to a uh, chicken muscle, right? Chicken relatively sedentary, uh, don't really fly around a lot, whereas a dove is a migratory bird that flies um, long distances over long durations of time. Um, and what you might expect is it actually creates different fiber types um, in these animals, such that the dove is a very dark meat uh, uh, animal, uh, very, very red, whereas the chicken is in general considered kind of a white meat, uh, right? So that's uh, one way that you can just kind of look. And this, this difference in color is, is based on a specific protein called myoglobin. The more you have in, the more oxidative that biochemical property uh, that this um, muscle can do, um, then therefore you can uh, base it on that. And therefore, since they have more uh, uh, oxidative metabolism, they're redder than uh, the, um, the white skeletal muscle. So the next is uh, fast and slow, slow twitch. Um, this became um, more relatively common by being able to take out skeletal muscle fibers and look at the size and speed and shape of them by kind of putting them in a bath and you can contract them and look and see how each of them contract. Um, some of them contract uh, really rapidly and reach their peak force in a rapid sense and some in a um, slow um, manner. And so therefore we'll, we'll look at that a little more specifically. Second, we have oxidative fast oxidative glycolytic and fast glycolytic. So these three um, are really talking about the biochemical properties. So kind of what is their major, uh, uh, what's their best way to produce um, ATP? And we'll work on that, but it's based on uh, metabolic staining and the characteristics of oxidative and metabolism um, um, and glycolytic enzymes. And then the last is uh, just kind of differentiating between type one and type two. And this is based um, kind of on um, an old school staining principle on the enzyme myosin ATPase under different uh, pH conditions uh, that we can actually then stain them, look under a microscope, and can then uh, section and look at what differences these are. Um, this method is actually kind of old. Um, the book actually talks quite a bit about this, and, and in my opinion, it's uh, slightly outdated, uh, especially coming from a muscle lab where we did um, a lot of fiber typing. Of, I've stared in, uh, in a microscope looking at skeletal muscle fibers and fiber typing um, a lot. Um, and so I'll give my perspective a little bit as we, as we go, but the kind of acid staining was, was kind of this brand new awesome technique back in the 70s and 80s, um, pioneered by a couple of guys. Uh, one guy, uh, Bob Armstrong, who um, uh, founded the, the lab that I did my PhD in actually at, at A&M. Um, did a lot of the fiber tapping, and that's how they originally did it, was just looking at HBA staining 
uh, and acid staining. We now have much better techniques and we'll go through those. So first let's break down what we mean when I said one of the objectives was biochemical properties. So what do we mean by biochemical properties? Uh, there's two main factors. One is the oxidative capacity. This is essentially the ability of mitochondria to produce ATP using oxygen. This is going to be a big, big focus in this class as we move forward in the metabolism section is this idea of, of using oxygen in order to um, um, be the final electron acceptor and make large amounts of ATP through um, aerobic metabolism. But for now, we'll just stick with if a skeletal muscle has a lot of mitochondria, that means that that mitochondria is able to generate a lot of ATP uh, um, by using oxygen as the final electron acceptor. And again, uh, we deliver that oxygen uh, from the capillary bed into the muscle using myoglobin, which gives um, a distinctive color. So if um, a muscle fiber is very highly anaerobic, it will be more red in color because of this myoglobin. And as uh, you'll see, uh, as we classify it as a fatigue resistant muscle, this means that the muscle uh, can produce lots of ATP for a long duration amount of time because of this aerobic metabolism. Uh, the second biochemical property that we can look at is myosin ATPase staining. Um, so ATPase um, is essentially, if you go back to um, looking at myosin, that kind of globular head is made up of ATP. Uh, and as you'll learn uh, very soon, uh, this is actually uh, one of the rate limiting steps in uh, muscle contraction. And so different fiber types actually have different um, biochemical makeups of the enzyme that is cleaving uh, the ATP and using that for the um, energy. So if a fiber contains a high ATPase activity, then they are able to rapidly break down ATP and contract faster, whereas if it has a slower ATPase, then of course it will contract slower. So then, since that's a biochemical, moves segues right uh, beautiful into the contractile properties. So we can look at um, maximal force production. So uh, in general, uh, we can uh, look at it based on specific tension, right? Because sometimes fiber types can be different sizes. So specific tension is defined as the force per unit of cross-sectional area. So if we have, in general, slow fibers are smaller than, um, than uh, fast fibers. And so what we can do is we can actually say, well, um, of course, you guys should be able to know this, but the bigger the fiber, the more force it produces, right? Uh, so if a person has bigger muscles, they can generate more force. If you translate that all the way down, um, then of course, how can you compare the two? So we can compare them by actually dividing by the amount of force produced divided by the cross-sectional area to give us this specific tension. And as you can imagine, um, the higher the force, the uh, different the fiber type. And we'll see that in the next figure. The next is the speed of contraction, which really gives rise to that definition of fast twitch and slow twitch muscles. Uh, so uh, um, the maximal shortening velocity, so how fast it reaches um, the, um, the uh, maximal force is known as the Vmax. And Vmax is again related to that biochemical property is determined by the rate of cross bridge cycling, which is determined by the uh, type and rate of myosin ATPase activity. Um, last but not least is the maximal power output. Uh, if you will remember, and we'll definitely go over this a lot in lab, but power is um, essentially um, force divided by time. And so um, if you generate force and divide it by the shortening velocity, then you can get the maximal power output. So this next figure um, gives us a really nice um, idea of uh, what the three fiber types are and then what their contractile properties look like. So our three fiber types um, in general are type ones, which are slow fibers. Uh, they are also um, slow oxidative fibers, if we continue to use those. And the last category that we talked about is, um, is red fibers. So as you'll see, the um, um, uh, slow muscle fibers there, type 1 fibers, have the uh, lowest peak power of the three fiber types if we look at contractile um, properties. We can also say that this is due to not only a lower sh uh, um, um, rate of reaching that, so our Vmax 
is lower, but there is also a lower specific tension. So type 1 fibers have the lowest Vmax and the lowest amount of specific uh, force development or specific tension. Uh, the next fiber type is kind of this hybrid intermediate fiber type that has a little bit of both worlds. Uh, this is the type 2A fiber. And type 2A fibers have um, a relatively high rate of power development, a relatively high rate of the max, and a relatively high rate of specific tension. These muscles are going to be um, somewhat red. They're going to be definitely closer on the red scale for breaking them into categories. And so we can define them as fast oxidative uh, muscle fibers. Uh, of course, the more of these you have, the better, right? So this is a little bit of the both worlds. Uh, they have fast and powerful movements, but they are also um, fatigue resistant, and so they can sustain that for um, a little bit longer. The last type muscle fiber type is the type 2X. Uh, I'll give this uh, uh, brief admission. You'll hear me say a lot um, type 2B fibers. Uh, so I have done a lot of work in the animal world. So in the mouse and rat, we don't have uh, type 2X fibers. Instead, they have 2Bs. Uh, so I will use them a lot. Humans have 2X. So most of the times what you'll hear me, if I can remember as I go through, is to call them type 2BX fibers, lumping them together. But again, the general classification is these are the fastest, most powerful muscle fibers. So they generate the um, highest amount of specific force. They generate it very, very rapidly. So their VMAX is very high. Um, and uh, therefore, they get this really, really um, high amount of force production. Uh, again, if we look at this and think about these three then in our biochemical properties, so our type 1 fibers then are going to be very oxidative fibers. Type 2A fibers are going to be highly oxidative. And then our type 2X are going to be very low oxidative, relying on the other uh, systems, mainly the glycolytic system. So type 2BX fibers are going to be very, very glycolytic. And if we think about them in the color spectrum, then they're going to be white. So how in the world do we actually go through and fiber type skeletal muscles? So the first is, of course, getting a muscle sample. So we can do that by using uh, the muscle biopsy technique. This is a technique to go in using about a five millimeter needle. That's um, about the size of this pen here um, to go in um, and actually pull out a small chunk. Uh, the most common site is taking it out of the thigh in the vastus lateralis, but uh, there's plenty of people who do it out of the soleus, deltoid, uh, even some of the trapezius muscles. Uh, so you're not necessarily limited, just it's most standard to do it out of the thigh. Um, and um, it's you know, really the only way we can do human research in skeletal muscle, but it does have its limitations. Obviously, we're taking it from uh, one small sample of a very large muscle. So the sample comes out weighing uh, about uh, 50 milligrams. So it's not very big. Uh, you can see uh, in the picture here that this uh, sample here in this uh, centrifuge tube is, is very small. Um, and so it's may or may not be representative of the whole muscle. And then, of course, uh, can we extrapolate that one finding to all skeletal muscles in the body? Now, some of you may be thinking, wait, did he just start this slide by saying they stick a needle the size of a pin in your leg? Um, I've actually had several, so I've had uh, at least four biopsies, um, and then a couple where they went back in a second time. Uh, so I think six total chunks of muscle taken out of my leg. Doesn't hurt at all. I've uh, been a part of, uh, of over 300 different biopsies, uh, being part of the team that, that's taking the biopsies in, in subjects who have been uh, doing resistance training. And uh, it's actually a semi-non-invasive procedure, doesn't hurt at all, leaves a, le a tiny, tiny little scar, um, but gives us a lot of information uh, being able to do that and being able to do that research. And uh, this is something that I, I hope to be doing here on, on campus uh, in the, the near future. So once we get it out, uh, the best way I mentioned uh, in the book, they talk about ATPA staining. Now we have even far better ideas that we actually can generate um, specific um, um, biological probes that will go in and bind to the specific ATPase that we're looking for. And so again, we can look at uh, fast ATPase, a medium or a slow, and we can stain them with a nice blue color. So this actually came out of um, my lab when I was a postdoc at, at um, the University of Florida, and we can actually look at the different colors 
So we get a green stain as the type 2A fiber, a blue is our um, nice slow type 1 fibers, and our black are our 2B or 2X fibers um, in this. So this is how we did a lot, most of our stuff there. Uh, mainly we did that because we wanted to go in and see um, the size of these muscles, so if they change. So uh, a lot of tedious work would go in uh, hand drawing little circles here to actually get uh, the cross-sectional area here of each muscle fiber to see how they changed. The other way that fiber typing can be done is to kind of run these uh, muscle samples through a gel matrix. So you get a biopsy and you kind of play Plinko is the, the way I would look at it, is, is to play Plinko through this kind of jello looking substance where you pass electricity through the protein bounce around and ultimately get separated by size here. We see several different uh, muscle samples. Each little lane here is a, is a muscle sample. And it allows us to kind of generalize a fiber type. So we can say, okay, this person has a lot of type 2B, 2BX fibers or a lot of type 1 fibers. Um, and so if we kind of look here, this person is, is very oxidative, right? They have a lot of uh, type 1 fibers, a lot of 2A fibers. Um, this person has very few fast fibers here, whereas this person and this person, pretty heavy amount. Uh, these are all relative. And so it gives you an idea that you can actually look and get a, an idea of like, okay, uh, what type of, um, what is the overall general makeup of, of this person's muscle fibers and, and how do they work? So again, this is just to um, kind of review uh, before we move on. But again, we have three muscle fiber types. Uh, we have 2B X fibers, which are fast twitch, fast glycolytic fibers, uh, very white in um, appearance. Um, and we can classify them as type 2. The other uh, fast fiber is the type 2A fibers. This is kind of that intermediate. Um, it is considered a fast twitch um, oxidative glycolytic fiber, so a little bit of both. So it can do both oxidative metabolism and glycolytic. So you'll hear most of it, people call it the fast oxidative. And finally, the type 1 fibers, which are, are slower twitch, lower amount of force, slow oxidative, very red fibers that are very fatigue resistant. Uh, it's important to note that, that I'll just comment to this though, that uh, while we make it nice, simple, these easy three packages, each muscle fiber um, is this nice, pretty um, one fiber type only, realistically, your muscles actually kind of exist on a continuum. And so you have uh, mu muscle fibers that can take up a little bit of the properties of all, of all of these, but it's really easy to just think about, we can take them out of a bath and they'll usually categorize, uh, take them out, put them in a bath, contract them, look at them metabolically, and they'll usually fit into one of these three categories uh, for the most part. So again, if we compare, um, taking the comparisons and looking at these, the easiest way to do it is to right, take polar opposites, right? So we have uh, three choices, type one, two A's, and two B X fibers. Um, so we can compare the ones and two A's, but realistically they're not all they're not super different and the two A's aren't that different from the two B X fibers. But if we go polar opposites, type one versus type 2 B or X, we can see um, a nice different um, comparison between. So first we can look at the um, average uh, 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 force that's produced. Again, as we mentioned, the type 2 B X fibers have a much higher force produced than uh, slow twitch fibers. And again, this is, um, uh, this is specific tension. So this is taking an account for uh, fiber type specific. Um, they also, type 2, the X fibers also have a much higher rate of Vmax, or essentially a, um, a time to peak tension is much lower, 50 milliseconds here in the fast twitch versus 100 milliseconds in the uh, slow twitch. If we look at the sarcoplasmic reticulum, uh, as we get into this, the whole goal of sarcoplasmic reticulum is to store and hold calcium to then be released and allow muscle contraction. We'll see that type 2 fibers have a much more highly developed sarcoplasmic reticulum. That means that they can release calcium much faster, which helps start contraction to be um, happen much faster and increase the Vmax or rate of muscle contractions. Uh, I don't want to talk about this too much. We'll get into motor units actually later in the neuromuscular physiology section. Um, so I'll skip that for now, but if we rate them on peak power, again, uh, as a review, type 2BX, type 2A are greater than type 1 fibers, 
And this is all kind of a combined effect, right? Lots of different things, including sarcoplasm reticulum, um, motor units. We have different um, ATPase activity. We have different ability, uh, different metabolic enzymes um, that we can all do that and we can measure it over that. So let's take a look and get into some exercise, right? So as you can imagine, uh, exercise, uh, if we're thinking about what fiber types would be most utilized during these, if we think about um, an aerobic uh, type endurance where we go out and run for a long time, of course, since type 1 muscle fibers are fatigue resistant, uh, they are highly uh, recruited during aerobic endurance exercise. They can maintain exercise for a long time uh, by relying heavily on oxygen for ATP production. These are also your muscle fibers that are just used all the time, right? So as I'm actually standing for this lecture, um, I'm not needing a great amount of force production, but my body thinks, hey, I don't know how long Dr. Wiggs is going to be standing there, so I'll use um, nice, slow muscle fibers that don't fatigue in order to keep me upright. Um, type 2 fibers in general, we can say um, not the best at aerobic endurance, uh, and that is because they fatigue quickly because they rely a lot on glycolytic or anaerobic metabolism. Uh, if we look at the two A's, uh, they're a little bit of both worlds. Uh, they have more force. They do fatigue faster than type 1 fibers, and so they can kind of be in this like middle range. Um, again, I give the ex example here. So these would be um, great to be used in kind of uh, short, higher intensities, although I'm not sure how many of us would consider 16 meters, 1,600 meters a, a short duration. Um, and then last but not least is the type 2B or X fibers. Um, these are seldomly recruited during everyday activities. The only way you're going to re recruit them is if you are starting to do a really explosive, high power, high needed movement, and we'll get into how that works um, when we get into the neuromuscular section. So again, uh, not only does this work, but if not only is this um, the pattern as they work for every day for you and I, who um, are maybe non-athletes or non-competitive athletes, uh, we recruit them in that pattern, but athletes in their specific for sports um, actually have um, uh, differences in fiber types. Uh, this is pretty interesting. It's uh, due to a couple things. One, due to just genetics, right? Some people are athletically gifted. Uh, sprinters um, are athletically gifted to have more uh, type 2 fibers. Uh, as you can see here, these sprinters, so they have many more white fibers or type 2 fibers than our red fibers, whereas our long-distance runners, marathons are nice, um, nice and red fewer type 2 fibers so they can do fatigue resistance and then this kind of middle of the ground road is, is kind of 50-50 which is um, kind of interesting right uh, so genetics plays a part in, in how you're born but then uh, these are actually uh, trainable as well um, not to a super degree it takes a lot of training and hard work but you can convert uh, fiber types uh, in general, the general thought is that fiber type shifting occurs in general getting you to a type 2A fiber um, profile. Again, it wants to kind of get you in the middle so you can shift type 1 fibers into that 2A uh, if you are a sprinter or if you are um, kind of genetically gifted to be um, in the sprinter category but decide you want to go in and start training for long distances, you will slowly shift from 2BX to type 2A fibers, and so everything kind of comes to that middle ground is the, the current thoughts on, on how uh, muscle fiber types uh, work. You'll hear a little bit about that in, in a video I'll, I'll have attached at the end. So again, if we, um, if we go through and review these fiber type characteristics, uh, this is something that uh, I got two tables here that you should be able to do uh, pretty easily and we'll have an activity for you to do this, but uh, we can compare these. So we have a couple different classifications. This um, only has three as the one I pulled out. So we have our type 1, type 2A, or our type 2BX. We can also classify them as slow twitch, fast twitch um, A or fast twitch X, or slow oxidative, uh, fast oxidative glycolytic, or fast glycolytic for the 2BX. Uh, the fourth system that I introduced at the beginning of the chapter was just uh, red and white. So our type 1 would be red, our type 2A would be uh, kind of a pink, and our type 2BX would be a, um, a white. We can look at them based on then a metabolic properties, right? Highly oxidative, low glycolytic in type 1, 
and then kind of reversed, we have pretty good oxidative capacity in the 2As and good glycolytic capacity in the um, in there. And the 2BX, very low oxidative, very high uh, glycolytic, which means these will fatigue fast, these will fatigue slow. Contractile speed, slow, hence the name slow twitch fibers, and fast in the type 2As. Fatigue resistance, very high type 1, very low and moderate in the type 2s. Um, and then we'll skip the motor unit um, size for now, um, but we can look at con contraction speed, aka Vmax, if you want to write that in here. So Vmax is uh, um, very slow, 100 milliseconds here in type 1, and about 50 milliseconds in type 2. What that means is you can generate more power in these. Uh, myosin ATPase, slow and fast, and then our sarcoplasm reticulum development or the development of this kind of calcium network, calcium dispensing network is low in type 1 and high. Um, so with that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to play a video that I think is, is really great. Uh, it comes from a speaker um, who comes out of the university, um, uh, comes from Ball State University. His name is Scott Trappy. He is uh, just an absolutely phenomenal scientist. I know you're thinking, I've never heard of Ball State in the world. Why is there someone there that does great work? Indeed, they have actually probably the premier uh, human performance laboratory in the world. Uh, they truly do really look at how to improve human performance. Uh, this is a segment of his talk from uh, the Texas ACSM uh, uh, Distinguished Lecture Series uh, this past uh, spring where he talked about getting the chance to um, biopsy and run a test on um, a uh, world champion uh, sprinter. And so I'm going to go ahead and play that for you now um, and I'll end this module. So I, I hope you enjoy his kind of insight and, and, and research um, ideas. The last part to finish up here is uh, learning from elite athletes. Uh, I was fortunate to get involved with test testing elite athletes during my master's degree and then during my doctoral work and uh, had a variety of opportunities over my career to do that with young and old. Uh, this was probably one of the more unique opportunities. This is Colin Jackson. We were contacted by the BBC and they were doing a series of profiles on what makes people sort of special or great and they had a musician, an artist, an athlete. Colin happened to be the athlete, and they contacted our lab to want to know what type of profile testing maybe we could do to gain some insight to if he had some unique physiology. So we felt, let's apply the types of things that we do, and I've been explaining to you all. So Colin and the camera crew from the BBC came uh, to Ball State to the Human Performance Laboratory, and we had a chance to run him through a series of tests, took a muscle biopsy, challenged him with a resistance exercise file, took another muscle biopsy, and uh, I'm going to show you the results from that, but I'd say he was a wonderful individual uh, to work with. So he's the former world record holder in the 110 meter hurdles and the current world record holder in the 60 meter hurdles. This is him third from the top. He's fast. Our thought process going into the project was that the power output from his type 2 fibers would be higher than what we typically see in people, and this might give some insight to why this guy was wicked fast. So what I'm showing you here is a variety of data we've gathered over the years. On top is the data from Colin, the world champion sprinter, distance runners, recreational runners, competitive swimmers, resistance trained, astronauts post-flight. And what you're looking at on this axis is single muscle fiber power, uh, standardized for muscle size. All right, so this is the power output of the slow fibers. You're not seeing huge differences, all right? But even his slow fibers are on that scale. Um, and it's compressed a bit so I can get all the data on here. But here's the fast fibers. And you can see how much more powerful his fast fibers are than the others, even more than the resistance training people that we've tested uh, in the laboratory. So the data more or less held with what we thought was going to happen. But that really wasn't the story. The story was this. We only see about one or two percent of these muscle fiber types in human muscle. 
and when our data first started coming in at the lab, it said 25% of his muscle was this pure 2X muscle fiber. And we've only seen data in spinal cord injury in the, in the literature with that. I didn't believe it. So had the lab do it again. We ran it uh, three times. Sure enough, 25% of this individual's muscle is super fast. We hadn't seen that. Any healthy individual. The only other athlete that I can find in the literature to support this is from the animal kingdom. And the cheetah has a lot of these 2X fibers, but the power profile from the cheetah pure 2X fiber is very comparable to the data that we got uh, from Colin Jackson. And when we challenged him to a resistance exercise bow, you're seeing the molecular response type one fiber, type two, look how responsive this 2X muscle fiber was to the exercise bow, this is FN14 again. And then here's myostatin. Myostatin's a negative regulator of muscle mass. So you're seeing, again, these 2X muscle fibers, very responsive to the exercise. Honestly, I'm not 100% sure how to interpret that, other than I'm thinking the idea that there's a lot of turnover, probably to maintain the viability of this fiber pool. Uh, and obviously, as you need genetic uh, gift. So take home message, um, scale of muscle has a high degree of plasticity, hopefully all you stud students got a good feel for that. Again, when I was in graduate school, this was considered to be somewhat of a static tissue, it's not, it's super dynamic, it's really tied into health, it's a whole frontier is uh, developing in terms of muscle tied into the overall metabolic and health of the individual. Um, exercise is an extremely uh, potent regulator of muscle health. I think that goes without saying, but there's been so much uh, work going on in this area, and I think it's going to continue to, to grow even more. So it's a fascinating area for future research. Limited scale of muscle plasticity with aging. Uh, I feel pretty comfortable saying this, given all the work we've done. Once you, it, it starts to trickle in when you're in your 70s, we're seeing stuff, but it becomes a little more um, pronounced when we're in our 80s, and we see this whole muscle down to the gene concept when we get to that stage. Um, that's not to say there aren't still a lot of positive adaptations of things that are going on with exercise. It's just that they're not as responsive uh, as we typically see in younger individuals. And lastly, hopefully you got an appreciation, the athlete's muscles highly sensitive to altered tra training loads. So this begs the question from our standpoint, we're seeing these changes or lack of changes as we get older. What about the aging athlete? Perhaps by continuing to use uh, these systems that uh, we, we can sort of slow or reverse the process a little bit. So we have a lot of activity going on in the laboratory evolving around this right now. And I know other labs are as well. I think this is a fascinating. Uh, area for inquiry going forward. And this is our lab group, most recent lab picture, Fall State. Uh